us this morning. We're glad to see you and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, this is going to be a, another workshop in our series of workshops on the Safe Drinking Water Plan. And uh, it, it, as Karen Larson will later explain, it's going to be relatively informal. I just want to do a few things to start off. Uh, first, what I always have to do is say uh, today is Wednesday, December 3rd at 10 10 almost uh, a.m. in the morning. Um, we will have, we had, but we will have three of our board members here today to listen. I'm Felicia Marcus, the chair of the board. Board member Stephen Moore and board member Tam Dodak uh, is also here somewhere, and I'm sure she'll be right in. We have senior staff here as well. Tom Howard, who's the executive director of the board. I saw Karen Turgovich, uh, one of our chief deputies, Jonathan Bishop, Another chief deputy, uh, Karen, you'll introduce Cindy, who's our um, number one on drinking water, uh, on all of that, and we'll all be here listening. Uh, to my far left is the clerk of the board, Janine Townsend, and assisting her is Courtney Davis. We refer to her frequently as she who must be obeyed, and Karen will explain um, Janine's role today. Uh, other things that I, I'm, uh, I need to do, and bear with me for those of you who've been at a lot of our meetings, it's a requirement in the building and a, and a prudent one. Look and find the exits that are closest to you or in your line of sight. And if you hear an emergency sound, pick up your stuff and carefully leave. And then he's doing hand motions to describe what you do. Oh, all right. Oh, I was like, who was that? Oh, Dee Dee. So we'll have four board members. Dee Dee Diadamo is also here. That's pretty good. I think Fran couldn't be here, so she's the only one. She's at Aqua. Um, so getting back to emergencies, which are important. Grab your stuff, be safe, and just go out into Cesar Chavez Park or anywhere you want, really. We, you don't have to go there. But we gather near 9th and, uh, or near 10th and J, and if you want to hang with us, you'll find out when the all clear is, and then we'll you know, come back, because uh, sometimes it is a drill, and sometimes it's not a long-term uh, emergency, but that's important to know. The other thing that's important to know is that the, this is being webcast and recorded, and so with that, rec you can see the difference. I'm not good at this. It means that when you um, speak into this microphone, and this is more for Karen, you have to get sort of close to it, because even though the rest of you could hear what I said before, the folks on the webcast might have been straining. Um, and we'll have a roving mic, and the same will hold true. It's just very important to make sure you can be heard, because we want to hear you, but we also want everybody else who's interested to be able to hear you. Also, if you have cell phones, pagers, or other things that make noise, please set it on silent or turn it off, because that can be very distracting uh, as people are speaking. And have I forgotten anything? Well, thank you. So um, with no further ado, I'm going to turn over the proceedings to Karen Larson, who is the Assistant Deputy Director of the Division of Drinking Water, to tell us how this morning is going to go. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Felicia. I guess I have to remember to get close to the mic. Uh, she already introduced me. I'd like to uh, start out by introducing the team and the staff from the Division of Drinking Water who are here in uh, the workshop. So I'll start with our Deputy Director of D the Division of Drinking Water, uh, Cindy Forbes. And uh, actually, can we... start with introductions. So this is the team that has been uh, working on finalizing the Safe Drinking Water Plan. Uh, I'll just say that Dave Spath has been integral in this recent, most recent update of the plan. He's really been the architect. He's here in the room with us today. So thank you, Dave, for coming all the way. Also, I'd like to introduce Liz Haven, who is our Deputy Director of Transitions. Liz has been working on the transition of the drinking water program from the Department of Public Health to the State Water Board for the past, what, year and a half or so, something like that. And in that capacity, she has been working with Dave and, and the department before the program moved over to get the plan updated and ready for release. And then I also want to introduce Nick Shudeau, who has been working with the team doing all things um, 
everything between logistics and getting workshops scheduled and getting posters, the nice poster that was out there, the, the, the look and feel of our presentations. He's been the everything man and the architect of the implementation plan working with the team. So that's our main group that's been working on the plan. I also want to introduce the other staff here from the division that are here. So we have Mark Bartson. He is uh, the chief of our technical operations branch here in Sacramento. Back in the back of the room, Bruce, you want to stand up and introduce Bruce Burton, uh, the Northern California Field Operations Branch Chief. We have Ollie, and I'm going to butcher his last name if I even try, so I'll let him introduce himself. <laughs> so he's the Sacramento District Engineer. Um, let me see. And then we have Kathy Ewing and Jerry Swoyer here in the back of the room. They are the attorneys that came over with the program. And did I forget anybody from the division? Then I also wanted to mention that we will be facilitating the discussion after I make my presentation. And so we have Office of Public Participation, Ray Bell, here in the room. She'll, she'll take over after I'm done with my talking head presentation. And if there's anybody in the room that needs interpretation, Spanish interpretation, we have Mandy Mock here uh, available for that purpose and just to touch base with her if you need those types of services. So the way that we're going to roll this today is I'll make the presentation. I'll start with the findings of the chapters two through nine, and then I'll leave it open for some clarifying questions about the findings. And then I will spend most of my time on the implementation portion to chapter 10 and the, uh, I don't remember what appendix it is, but the appendix table about what are we going to do, what are the recommendations from the plan, and what, what are we committing ourselves to doing as a result of the findings of the plan. When we get to the end of the present, well, during questions and then at the end of the presentation, um, <coughs> we will be roving a microphone, keeping it relatively informal, so anyone that has comments will be sure to have a microphone, speak into it clearly so that uh, those on the webcast can hear you. Also, if you do plan to uh, make any comments, please provide a speaker card to Janine, the clerk to the board. She will be organizing those and keeping a record of, of who is speaking at the workshop. All right, so with that, I think I'll get started. There we go. So I'm going to start off with um, the purpose of the plan and the purpose of this meeting and the other five workshops that we've done across the state. Um, the legislature set forth the purpose of the plan back in 1996, which is to um, assess the overall quality of the state's drinking water, as well as to identify any drinking water quality problems and make recommendations to address those problems. It goes a little bit beyond just drinking water quality. You, uh, if you've read the plan, you'll see chapters. Oh, sorry, I'm not close enough. I have to eat it. Uh, <laughs> Um, you'll see chapters on things like information systems and emergency response, and I will go over those, but the, the primary purpose of the plan is to really identify problems and make recommendations on how we plan to fix them. Um, the plan primarily focuses in on public water systems that have less than 10,000 service connections, and that's all, again, part of what's in the legislation that requires the updates to the plan. Now, that leaves out very small systems, those that have less than 15 connections and domestic wells, and we recognize that there are many water quality problems across the state in, for those very small systems, and uh, that those problems are not going to be solved quickly. They're pretty complex and pretty wide um, spread but that um, we are committed to doing what we can and partnering with local agencies and uh, entities to help those folks that are served by very small systems, not a public water system. And in fact, we've already done some work to assist those systems. We have emergency drought funding and in some instances have uh, 
been able to consolidate very small systems with a larger system to address their water quality and water supply problems. We also have been working with a working group of the governor's office, the task force on systems with less than 15 connections to identify where those uh, systems are most vulnerable both for water quality problems as well as supply problems. So we are doing uh, what we can, um, but again, this plan is not focused on those very small systems. Just wanted to acknowledge that right up front. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say about that? So that's the purpose of the plan, and the purpose of this meeting and the other five workshops that we've held around the state is to get input from stakeholders on the plan and um, give you an opportunity to ask questions and provide input before we finalize the plan. At the end of my presentation, I have a slide on the timeline and what our plans are for finalizing it, and so I'll, I'll wait uh, till then to tee that up. All right. So, where are we on this? Um, the history of the plan is that the first safe drinking water plan for the state was issued to the legislature in 1993. Subsequent to that plan, and actually it was quite a thick document. Cindy has one in her office. It's a, it's quite a, a an encyclopedia. Uh, subsequent to that, the legislature. Uh, adopted legislation that required periodic updates to the plan. So every five years, the Department of Public Health, actually I think it was DHS at the time, uh, was required to update the plan every five years. And there was some effort to update it in 1998, and uh, yet no, no updates to the plan have been issued since 1993. So the department was sued for not updating the plan and had a settlement agreement that required them to update the plan and issue it to the legislature by October 6th of 2014, which of course was about two months ago. During that interim period, there was a lot of discussion about moving the division of, or excuse me, the drinking water program from the Department of Public Health to the State Water Board. And in fact, that did occur this past July 1st, the program was moved over to the State Water Board. And so we became the implementers, we, the water boards, became the implementers of the plan. So we negotiated with the plaintiffs and they agreed to allow us to issue a draft of the plan and hold these workshops across the state to get input and then to finalize the plan no later than June 15th of 2015. So <clears throat> that, I'll, I'll tell you the next steps in the plan for getting there. Um, what I think, is good about that is again we became the implementers of the plan so that gave the water boards an opportunity to align the recommendations in the safe drinking water plan with plans policies and other recommendations that we've made to the legislature or um, uh, well just plans and policies so for example the nitrate report that came out a couple of years ago had some recommendations that are mirrored here in the plan um, now that we kind of had the opportunity to put our fingerprints on it. So I think that was a good thing. Um, so that brings us to where we are today. So I'm going to go over the findings of the chapters two through nine and then uh, leave it open for questions as I mentioned before. Just clarifying questions, no comments until the end. And then I'm going to spend most of my time on the implementation plan and what we've committed ourselves to doing. Um, so with that, let's go. Chapter 2. Chapter 2 gives us an overview of um, the various agencies with responsibility for regulating drinking water quality. And what we found that is that since 1993 and over the years, we have, we as a program, I'll just call it collectively we, because it's only been with the water boards for a few months, um, but the program has improved its coordination among state and uh, federal and local agencies in regards to regulating drinking water quality. But there needs to be additional improvements made primarily to align ourselves in terms of our regulatory authorities and there's a number of recommendations I'll go into later about how we can do a better job of aligning our authorities to protect drinking water quality. Um, 
We also want to uh, coordinate better to discourage proliferation of unsustainable systems. And um, finally, the chapter points out the fact that the funding, oh, excuse me, and, in, and increase assistance for communities that are not adequately served by a public water system. And finally, this chapter in, uh, identifies the need for a more uh, robust, uh, sustainable, uh, consistent funding for the program. Um, we have a number of funding sources, some of which are rather tenuous, and uh, our fee structures are not uh, such that can um, support the program in its current form. So we need to um, <coughs> work to modify the structure of our fees. Chapter 3 provides an overview of um, drinking water quality across the state. The good news is that 98% of the population of the state of California that are served by a public water system, let me be clear on that, are served drinking water that meets water quality, drinking water standards. So that's good. However, I, as I mentioned earlier, the plan doesn't address nor analyze the quality of water that's being served to at domestic wells or very small systems under 15 connections. So I just want to make that clear again. Um, yet we are committed as part of the human right to water to do what we can to assist those very small systems in uh, getting serving water that meets standards. Um, this chapter also highlights significant challenges that public water systems face. For example, new contaminants that come emerge on the scene as our analytical methods become more um, sensitive. We identify new contaminants all the, all the time. And therefore, we often have new regulations that come to regulate those new contaminants. Well, those are all very stressors and costly for systems to comply with. Um. <coughs> OK. so. There's additionally uh, increasing stresses on public water systems in terms of and, re and supply resources, including climate change, um, vulnerability to emergencies and incidents, population growth. Um, and as a result, new sources of drinking water are going to need to be explored, for example, recycled water. Um, finally, all of these increasing challenges are all the more acute for small public water systems, many of which lack the expertise and funding to operate and maintain the complex treatment systems that are needed to treat water to meet drinking water standards. And the, this lack of operations and maintenance capacity in many of these very sm the small systems are severe, severely impacts drinking water quality that um, these systems deliver. All right, moving on to chapter four, where we focus on the challenges that small water systems face in meeting drinking water standards. And we found that most of the water quality issues uh, have been addressed with the exception of arsenic and nitrate, and then, of course, the upcoming uh, requirements for Chrome 6. In addition, most of the systems with water quality problems are those with less than 10,000 service connections, and furthermore, small water systems with fewer than 200 connections have the greatest proportion of systems that are out of compliance with water quality standards. So in 2012, the drinking water program, when it was still at public health, created a small water systems plan whereby they identified 183 systems that, they, that were out of compliance with drinking water standards that the program would track and assist to get back into compliance. And we found uh, from our data from 2013 that we got eight of those systems back into compliance, but recently looked at what systems are making little to no progress and have found that mobile home parks are one uh, sector of the public water system community that is making the least progress toward meeting standards. And so that'll speak to some of the recommendations that I'll talk about later. Um, 
Ultimately, the solution to these compliance problems we found are um, helping systems to increase their technical abilities through technical support, their financial support for infrastructure improvements, and sufficient support for operations and maintenance. And that'll be a theme you'll hear a couple of times today. Chapter 5 is one that's somewhat near and dear to my heart because my former position before joining the program was to be the program liaison to our IT department here at the Water Boards. And I'll just be frank, the systems, the IT systems, the data management systems that the drinking water program uses on a daily basis to do their work are antiquated and on the brink of failure and maybe even failing as we speak. So um, the point here is that upgrading these systems is not free. It costs money to do that, and the funding for that needs to be included in our, in our funding structure for the program. Um, in this digital age, I'm sure probably everyone in this room has either on their person or somewhere nearby a cell phone. I have mine right here in my pocket, and everyone <laughs> expects to be able to get information readily at their fingertips. And the water boards are very much committed to transparency and uh, getting information out to the public. And so the, the, now that the drinking water program is with the water boards, we're committed to um, doing that as well. Um, so there we go. <coughs> Chapter 6 describes the current and emerging technologies for analyzing for contaminants of concern in drinking water. Um, because monitoring is a significant cost of compliance, the drinking water program is always interested in finding uh, better and cheaper ways to analyze for constituents for, um, for monitoring for compliance. Microphone, sorry. I'm trying to... <coughs> Excuse me. And there's been some limited success in uh, developing cheaper analytical methods. For example, nitrate is one that can be monitored continuously with a device that is relatively inexpensive and provides real-time data. But that is only one very limited example. We know that there are many contaminants of concern in drinking water that um, we don't even know at what levels are of most concern. And it's very expensive to analyze for those chemicals at a very low level. Similarly, analytical methods for pathogens um, are complex and therefore quite expensive. And so in the future, we expect to continue to need to use indicator organisms as uh, indicators of pathogens in drinking water. Um, but in the end, it's not likely that monitoring expenses will be reduced through identification of less expensive methods. So we need to figure out other ways to uh, improve or reduce the cost of complying with drinking water standards. And I'll just say that the water boards have been very much involved with an effort to look at cost of complying with our regulatory programs. And so this is something that is, is um, in our board members are interested in and uh, will probably bleed over into the drinking water program as well. All right, so chapter seven provides an overview of current treatment technologies used to reduce the risk of exposure to contaminants in drinking water. And we found in our plan that there are treatment technologies available for treating all contaminants that we have, for which we have MCLs. However, <coughs> excuse me, installing and maintaining the needed treatment is a challenge for many small systems, as I've mentioned before. And I'll just reiterate that infrastructure improvements and added treatment technologies are useless unless a small system has the, the funding and the expertise to maintain those systems in the future. There is a case study in the plan of a system that uh, got funding to install treatment for arsenic and had did not have the technical, managerial, and financial expertise to maintain that system, and it's currently not even online. 
All right, we're in the home stretch. <laughs> Chapter 8 mm -hmm. focuses on the financial aspects of treating and delivering drinking water that meets standards. And due to the many issues that I've already discussed, the cost of treating and delivering safe drinking water has increased significantly. Metering is one way to uh, assist systems with setting appropriate rates and uh, encouraging conservation. Uh, however, there are more than 30% of public water systems in the state that are not currently requiring metering uh, at their uh, metering their consumers' uh, water usage. There's also a disparity in the rates that customers pay for their water, and because of a lack of economy of scale, the consumers of water from small public water systems generally pay more higher rates for their water than, than consumers who are served by a large water system. And yet in many instances, they're served substandard uh, drinking water they, that don't meet drinking water standards. <coughs> Um, let's see. Oh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, the infrastructure and um, treatment improvements are useless without the capacity to operate and maintain those systems. And we're committed to finding ways to make water affordable for every Californian. All right, the last chapter with findings is chapter nine, and it emphasizes the need for public water systems to prepare for, re for the response to emergencies and incidents that could impact their public water system. Unfortunately, we found that public water systems are not keeping their emergency response plans up to date, and yet after 9-11, the personnel of public water systems are considered first responders because of the critical infrastructure that they're in charge of that could impact public health in the event of an emergency. Um, but there are resources available for public water systems. We just need to get um, training and outreach to those systems so that they are prepared in the event of an emergency. All right, so I'm gonna stop there for a few minutes and ask if there are any clarifying questions from anyone in the audience on the findings. So this is not an opportunity to make comments, it's just clarifying questions, anything that you read in the plan in those chapters two through nine that wasn't clear, or you needed more information. So I'll stop for just that for a minute. Is there anyone? And we'll, uh, we'll have some rovers coming around, yeah. Hi, Karen. Uh, Brian Lawrence and Larry Walker Associates. Was there any scope um, to look at, uh, so I mean, and, and, and what was the scope, I guess, to look at uh, source, especially surface water, uh, source water uh, quality? Um, <clears throat> it was a little confusing reading through it, you know, knowing when you were talking about the supply side versus the source side. If you could repeat. Here, I'll repeat. The, was there any assessment of source water quality as part of the plan? Well, part of the uh, the monitoring that goes on is on source water quality to start out with. So, uh, a lot of chapter um, three reflected um, both source water quality and finished water quality. In fact, chapter four was more on finished water quality. Chapter three was reflective of source water quality. So um, I think it may not have been quite clear with regard to that, but that's the way the, the two chapters were structured. Thank you. I'm Adan Ortega with the California Association of Mutual Water Companies. Um, in your non-compliance numbers, did you include those systems that are um, part of, uh, I think it was the National Water Research Foundation, they did a cost assessment um, and they looked at compliance uh, based on samples that were taken on hex chrome. They found over 300 systems um, that uh, do not meet the standard. There's a good number of them. I don't know how many of them. 
um, cannot afford to meet the new standard. Are those numbers included uh, in your report? No. Other clarifying questions? All right, seeing none, I'll move on. <coughs> so chapter 10 essentially takes the recommendations from each of the chapters and consolidates them into 10 categories of types of recommendations. And so you see them up here on this diagram. They're drought, affordable, safe drinking water for disadvantaged communities, shared solutions, capacity development, program funding, program actions, transparency and information management, treatment and analytical methods, and emergency preparedness and response. So chapter 10 goes into the narrative of each of the uh, recommendations that come from the chapters. And then you'll see in the appendix, the last appendix in the plan, is a table of all of the recommendations that have the uh, time frame that we're committing ourselves to doing um, certain of these recommendations. The one thing I want to make clear is that some of these recommendations are ones that we can do now with our existing authority and our existing resources. And I'll point out those um, as I move through them. Others of them require additional resources. And where you see as resources allow and the recommendation, that means we don't have enough resources to fully implement that recommendation at this time. And then there are others that not only do we not have resources, but we don't ha even have the authority to do. Um, and so those uh, stated, uh, let's see if I can make it clear, um, that we recommend enactment of legislation. And so many of them require legislative action for us to uh, implement. So I just wanted to make that clear. Some of them don't include time frames because we don't have authority to do them at this point. So I'm going to start with one that has been on people's minds, although it's kind of difficult to keep it on the brain when you've got an inch of rain falling outside, um, but drought. And I'll just say that we are not out of it, even though it's pouring down rain today. Um, and we have a couple of recommendations around how to respond to ongoing drought. Now. Just because we have a couple of recommendations doesn't mean that's all that we're doing here at the water boards to address drought. Uh, we have emergency conservation regulations that the board adopted last summer and are tracking implementation of those conservation measures at uh, each of their board meetings, it seems like, or at least monthly. We also have issued from our Division of Water Rights curtailment notices to over 9,000 water right holders in the state. In the coordination with the Division of Water Rights, the Division of Drinking Water issued some compliance orders to public water systems who were diverting illegally based on those uh, curtailment notices. Those compliance orders required these systems to implement the conservation measures, uh, meter their con customers where they ha aren't already metering, a connection moratorium and to do a source reliability study. So there's a number of things that we're doing related to drought that's just a smattering of them. So don't think just because we have only two recommendations that's all we're doing. Um, so the first recommendation is to uh, require metering of all public water systems um, across the state. Right now urban water systems are required to meter their customers by 2025. This is a recommendation to enact legislation. So this is one that we don't currently have the authority to do, um, other than on a case-by-case -case basis. As I mentioned, the compliance orders had some metering requirements in them. Um, but this would be a broad-based requirement for everyone across the state to install meters to both allow systems to set rates that are based on the volume of water that is served as well as to encourage conservation both through the bill that uh, consumers pay and uh, giving that information to the consumers on their bill. What, what uh, water volume are they using and how does that compare to what they've used in the past? The second recommendation, oh, 
did I do that backwards? No, I did it right. All right. Second recommendation is to require source reliability studies uh, where appropriate. So I already mentioned we identified a number of systems that had only one source that then became curtailed due to the drought. And so they had claims that they needed to continue to divert because they needed to meet the requirements in the health and safety code to provide uh, potable drinking water to their consumers. And so we will continue to identify on a case-by-case -case basis when uh, source reliability studies are necessary. Yeah. We need a, just a quick clarification, Karen. Um, so you mentioned that drought could be a, a driver for the source reliability studies, but it also looking at the recommendations that relates to the earlier question about um, water quality can also be a, uh, a reason to do the source reliability. <coughs> All right, this is the the longest section: affordable, safe drinking water um, for disadvantaged communities. So. Um, there's a laundry list of recommendations here, and I'll just start from the top. This is essentially our uh, recommendations combined to meet our goal of um, affordable, safe drinking water, but also uh, the human right to water across the state, and particularly focused on disadvantaged communities. So the first two recommendations are around coordinating with local agencies to um, uh, to address drinking water quality issues in, very, in small systems, and they come in a couple of flavors. The first one is addressing where there are public water systems and consumers uh, served by public water systems. And what we're committing to do is by the second quarter of 2015, so even before we've got our, our plan finalized, we will um, coordinate with local, county, and city planning departments as, as we have resources available, the LAFCOs and the local health jurisdictions, um, to identify areas that are developed that don't have safe drinking water to, to determine if a community services district is necessary or if there needs to be improvements to housing or additional development should be postponed in those areas until safe drinking water can be identified. So the first one is all around public water systems. The second is a commitment to working again with those local planning departments and local health jurisdictions to do what we can to address drinking water quality problems in very small systems. So less than 15 connections, domestic wells, those kinds of things. So the first one is one where we clearly have regulatory authority. The second is more to partner with the local agencies to address the very small systems. So that's 2-3 and 2-4 at the top of the list. 2-7 is a recommendation to provide funding for infrastructure improvements for small public water systems that don't currently serve water that meets drinking water standards. So infrastructure improvements such as additional treatment, um, improvements to distribution systems, those kinds of things. And this was an, this recommendation had an eye toward the bond that we all just passed last month. And so that is now in place and we probably will be needing to update the plan to acknowledge that. There's $260 million in the Prop 1 budget for drinking water for disadvantaged communities and we are currently working on how those funds will be um, allocated and distributed among um, first internally and then how uh, we'll be implementing that grant program into the future. And we're working closely with our Division of Financial Assistance to uh, figure all of that out. All right, so I'm going to point out that 4-3 and 4-5 look very similar. So 4-3 is a reiteration of a recommendation that came from our nitrate report, which um, recommends um, that we have legislation to address where nitrate is a problem in disadvantaged communities and recommends some funding sources that could be used or uh, could be proposed to be used to support um, 
cleaning up nitrate or um, figuring out how to um, address both the treatment technology infrastructure improvements but also operation and maintenance of those systems in disadvantaged communities. I'm going to skip to 4-5 because it's also related to funding for operations and maintenance. And 4-5 is more focused on other types of constituents. So nitrate has very specific sources and nitrogen uh, containing fertilizer material tax, those kinds of funding sources are um, appropriate for nitrate. But what do we do about naturally occurring constituents such as arsenic and um, in many instances chrome 6? Um, so 4-5 talks about the need to have operations and maintenance funding to um, install and maintain systems for treating those types of constituents. Then I'll go back to 4-4, which is that we will commit to ongoing commitment to work with the regional water boards to identify where a responsible party is responsible for contamination of a source of drinking water and require under our cleanup and abatement authority the responsible party to mitigate the contamination as well as provide uh, alternative uh, bottled water, for example, or interim water to uh, the consumers so that they're um, they're receiving safe drinking water while the cleanup is happening, if that's feasible. All right, 8-4 is, um, oh, and I'll just say that we are committing in 4-4 on an ongoing basis to work with the regional board, so that's something we'll continue to commit to doing. 8-4 is um, related to the fact that there are many individuals and families that are served drinking water that does meet standards, but that it's not affordable. So there's, uh, this can be in rural, rural communities as well as urban communities. And so this is a recommendation for the legislature to consider some sort of um, tax credit for these individuals to, uh, to help them be able to afford the drinking water, even though they, they are in a disadvantaged community, but they're being served um, quali high quality drinking water or water quality that meets drinking water standards, um, and yet it's not affordable. 8-6, we are committing to annually assessing alternatives for uh, helping small disadvantaged communities to uh, build the capacity for uh, treating their drinking water and delivering uh, water that is um, safe for their consumers. This is related to a process we do every year, which we identify alternatives and make pro um, proposals for legislation um, annually. And so we're committing ourselves to doing that each year. And then finally, we recommend uh, continuing emergency grant funds to help disadvantaged communities that have um, serious water quality problems. All right. So the governor's stakeholder group on drinking water um, met for several months, um, primarily uh, as a result of the nitrate report that came out from the water boards. And they talked a lot about this concept of shared solutions or regional solutions. And so we combined a few of our recommendations that speak to that concept of shared solutions. So um, we're committing on an ongoing basis to encourage large water systems to assist small water systems in sampling and analysis, um, particularly for the small systems that are out of compliance. Um, and uh, including surface and groundwater. Um, so there's an example in Orange County where there's a large water system. They have their own laboratory. They provide the, the smaller systems in their area with assistance with analyzing uh, for their compliance monitoring, those kinds of things. And so we will continue to encourage those types of partnerships into um, the future. We also want to continue to promote consolidation of small water systems with larger systems where feasible. Now I want to make it clear, and it may not be crystal clear in the plan right now, that we're not talking about just consolidating for the sake of consolidating. We're focused in on helping small systems that 
do not have the capacity or are unsustainable systems in finding ways to consolidate annex with um, a larger system that to where they can become sustainable. And finally, um, we recommend enactment of legislation to mandate um, consolidation in some instances. And included in that, we want to ensure that any liability issues are addressed so that there are incentives for larger systems to consolidate with the smaller systems and help them become sustainable into the future. So staying with the theme of helping small water systems, we've got a section on capacity development. The drinking water program for many years has had federal funding for a capacity development program. We provide technical assistance from uh, at the field operations level to small systems. Uh, our local primacy agencies also uh, provide assistance. And then we have contracts with nonprofit organizations that provide assistance to small systems. And so this, this section is all around what we can do uh, to help continue to build capacity in these small systems. So the first two are ones that on an ongoing basis we're committing to um, as our resources allow. And the first one is to expand the goal of the small water systems plan. I already mentioned that the drinking water program had uh, developed a small water systems plan in 2012 and we're continuing to track those 183 systems but we have found over the last uh, few months since the program has been with the water boards we've been doing a little bit more data crunching and found that 183 is just a subset of the small systems that are out of compliance and it's more like 300 ish i'll say um, so that's quite a bit more than the, the initial plan had identified. And so we're committing to expanding that goal and to tracking uh, all of the systems that are out of compliance on an ongoing basis and helping them to uh, identify funding sources, apply for funding, uh, and uh, just in general helping build their capacity and sustainability. Um, also, as part of our capacity development program, we'll continue to encourage community water systems to adopt an uh, assets management plan for infrastructure replacement as part of their rate setting process. And um, that will, we are committing to doing on an ongoing basis as well. 2-1 goes back to the comment that I made earlier about the fact that many of the small water systems that are most of the small water systems that we found that are not making progress towards uh, getting back into compliance with drinking water standards are mobile home parks. And the Department of Housing and Community Development has authority over the rent that can be charged by um, owners of these mobile home parks. And so we've had some success in coordinating with housing and community development to put pressure on these owners, particularly ones that are just, you know, the slum type owners of these mobile home parks, to put improvements uh, in their drinking water systems to so that their consumers are served drinking water that meets standards. And so we're committing ourselves uh, in 2015 to figure out the best way to partner with housing and community development where we've identified these sort of recalcitrant mobile home park owners uh, and kind of coordinate our authorities to address those, those major issues. We also are committing in 2015 to figure out the best and most efficient way to work more closely with the local planning agencies, the LAFCOs, and address the technical, managerial, and financial issues um, with the small water systems that are under their purview. And on an ongoing basis, we're committing to exploring the possible funding sources to uh, provide training to operators so that we improve the expertise available to these small water systems um, for their operators to operate and maintain their systems. 
So program funding, this is a short one, and I already mentioned that uh, we currently don't have um, a consistent and reliable uh, source of funding to sustain the drinking water program, and this is a recommendation to enact legislation that provides the program with appropriate funding so that we can meet the goals that we've identified in this plan. So program actions, this section are ones that we think we have both the resources and authority to do now. So we're on an ongoing basis, we're committing to encouraging uh, new and existing board members of public water systems to re get trained on their responsibilities as board members um, and their responsibility over the budget and the um, infrastructure that they're in charge of at the public water systems. Right now, mutual water companies have requirements to for their board members to be trained. We would like to um, encourage that to be expanded to all types of water systems across the state. 4-4 is a repeat. This is one that we are committing to on an ongoing basis, again, to work with the regional boards to identify where drinking water is contaminated and by a, a specific responsible party and using cleanup and abatement authorities to require those responsible parties to mitigate that contamination um, in those areas. And then 8-2 relates to the struggle that many systems have in setting rates and um, setting appropriate rates that allow them to operate and maintain their systems, uh, make infrastructure improvements. Um, so we are committing with our new public information officer who happens to be here in the room <laughs> um, to develop fact sheets, outreach materials, to educate the public on what it really costs to deliver safe drinking water to um, every Californian. Transparency and information management, I already mentioned that it's critical that we have information systems that we can use to do our daily work, but also to make information available to the public and to decision makers. And so we're recommending legislation to um, include in the funding for the program, funding for improving our data management systems and uh, getting information out to the public, um, as does the water boards already. All right, the section on treatment and analytical methods is basically the recommendations here are ones that we're committing ourselves to doing on an ongoing basis, which is to continue to coordinate research needs, uh, including methods for testing for microbes using emerging technologies, um, faster technologies, possibly less expensive. Um, we're also continuing to stay abreast of and provide technical input on development of field testing methods for some regulated uh, contaminants. And we're recommending additional funding for research and demonstration grants to develop new treatment processes or improve the cost efficiency of existing treatment processes and including exploring the possibility of point of use and point of entry devices as a cost effective way of treating some of the contaminants of concern in drinking water.